Chapter 3 City of Gold, Law, Marriage, and Politics By 1941, when Nelson Mandela reached Johannesburg, known among Africans as Egali, City of Gold, it was the largest and most industrially developed city in South Africa, if not the entire continent of Africa. However, segregation laws marked off the city center and inner neighborhoods. As a white city, Mandela and his cousin Justice therefore headed for the gold mines in hope of work and to the black townships for a place to live. The next few years were to prove a decisive turning point in his life. But first he had to adapt to life in an entirely different environment. The city of Johannesburg and surrounding areas, known collectively as the Rand, short for the Witwatersrand, Ridge of White Water in Afrikaans, was the site of the fabulously rich gold deposits that since 1886 had driven national economic growth. Yet, although gold had brought great prosperity to white Johannesburg, the lot of black miners was an unhappy one. The gold was deep underground, the work hard and dangerous, with high rates of both industrial accidents and debilitating industrial diseases such as tuberculosis and silicosis. The wages of black miners were pitifully low. Effectively, they did not change in real terms between 1910 and 1960. Whereas in the United States in this period, the gap between white and black wages was narrowing, in South Africa, the index of blacks. Real earnings actually declined while the corresponding figures for white miners, who earned approximately 15 times more than black miners did, continued to rise. To add to this misery, mine companies and laws strongly discouraged black miners from bringing wives or families with them, forcing them to live in single-sex compounds or hostels where they often slept, on crude cement bunks and ate very poor food. Beatings underground. 24. Nelson Mandela. From white supervisors were common and often went unchecked. Government and companies opposed African labor unions and it was only in the 1940s that a fragile African mine workers union was established. The linchpin of these severe industrial relations was the job kalaba that reserved skilled work for white artisans. 1. The Johannesburg that Mandela made home was the site of rapid urban change. World War II intensified the pace both of South African industrialization and of black urbanization and incorporation into the work force. Growing pressure to relax segregation and give rights to black unions accompanied these trends. The combination of rigid segregation and mine work had thrown up grim black neighborhoods or townships, such as the densely populated, chaotic Alexandra to the north of the city, and the sprawling settlements to the southwest, later known as Soweto. Yet despite segregation there were still pockets of multiracial settlement, notably Sophia Town, a neighborhood to the west that sported a vibrant multiculturalism and music. The 1940s also were a time of black literary renaissance. This harsh but vibrant urban world was a novelty for Mandela. He had heard stories of criminal gangs or tzatzis on the rand. He therefore took the precaution of bringing with him a revolver, a measure that proved embarrassing when police charged a friend, conveying for him the weapon with possession of an unlicensed firearm. Mandela rescued his friend by confessing it was his gun. Police released him with a caution. Justice had an offer of clerical work at Crown Mines and convinced the African Works Supervisor or Induna, Mr. Poliso, to employ Mandela. As a result, in April 1941 Mandela secured temporary work as a security guard at Crown Mines. Within a month, however, the Induna discovered the young men's ruse and angrily waving a telegram from Mandela's guardian, the regent John Jantaba that stated, send boys home at once, he dismissed. Um. The two young men next sought the assistance of a friend of the regent, Alfred Bitaini Shuma, one of the very few African medical practitioners, on the Rand and, from December 1940, also the president general of the African National Congress, ANC, the main black political organization. The previous year, Following a visit of John Jintaba to his Johannesburg clinic, Shuma had assisted with Mandela's transport to and entrance into Fort Hare, too. So already there was a relationship between the two men. Shuma's kind offer of assistance to help them find a job on the mines, however, led back only to Mr. Poliso, who again sent the young men packing. 
At the age of 23 and with no close kin nearby, Mandela found himself stranded in the bustling city with no job. At first, he obtained temporary. City of Gold 25. Lodgings with a cousin, Garlic Bikini, a small trader originally from Nkobo in Thembuland, who lived in the nearby George Gotch Township, a young African nurse who had observed Mandela's poverty-stricken predicament contacted her friend Albertina Totowi, who soon helped Mandela meet her fiancé, Walter Sisulu. The meeting was destined to change the whole course of Mandela's life. Like Mandela, Sisulu hailed from Thembuland. Six years Mandela's elder, he owned one of the few black businesses in Johannesburg, a small real estate agency called Sitha Investments, Mandela's cousin referred to Sisulu as one of our best people in Johannesburg. Despite this apparent success, unlike Mandela, Sisulu was from a modest background, his Kosa mother had worked as a domestic servant and his father, a white assistant magistrate, had abandoned him. As a young man in the 1930s, Sisulu had labored on the mines and in factories, once losing his job for leading a strike for a living wage before turning his hand to small business. Sisulu lived in the African dormitory suburb of Orlando, where he was active in local culture and politics, heading an African choir and becoming prominent in both a Kosa cultural body, the Orlando Brotherly Association, and the Orlando branch of the ANC. By now city and politics-wise, the older man would become Nelson Mandela's mentor. 3. Arriving at Sisulu's office in downtown Barclay Arcade, the site of an African businessperson with his own office and secretary tremendously impressed Mandela. He was even more amazed to hear that Sisulu lacked a higher education but rather had knowledge and skills from the university of life. Sisulu, upon hearing that the younger man wished to study law, detected a future leader of the African community and, only too aware, that he had to deal daily with purely white lawyers, promised to help secure him a position with a law firm. Years later, Sisulu would recall that, when Mandela first walked into his office, I knew that he was someone who would go far and should be encouraged. He could see that Mandela's personality was very striking, very warm. The two men soon became lifelong friends and comrades in arms. For, in the meantime, in search of a place of his own to stay, Mandela had moved six miles north of Johannesburg to the Black Enclave of Alexandra Township. This was a densely settled square mile that, like Sophia Town, had somehow survived as a place where Africans could still buy freehold title to land. Elsewhere they increasingly were pushed into segregated ghettos. Alexandra, surrounded by affluent white suburbs, was a black island in a white sea. Yet despite its poverty and jumble of winding streets, its lack of electricity earned it the nickname Dark City, was a small haven of freedom. It was home to a pulsating black urban culture. 26. Nelson Mandela. That gave birth to such trends as the popular penwhistle music known as Quella Jazz, captured in the 1950 film The Magic Garden, and to urban self-help associations such as the Daughters of Africa. To Mandela, life in Alexandra was exhilarating and precarious five, and his personal, working, and political life began to develop. On arrival in Alexandra, he stayed first with the family of the Reverend J. Mabutho, a Thembu and a family friend, but who, after hearing of Mandela's flight, from the regent, asked him to leave, although not before assisting him to find a room nearby with the Homa family. At that juncture, Mandela fell in love with and courted Ellen Cabend, a Swaza woman whom he had known at Heldtown. However, before very long she left town, and they lost touch with each other. Mandela also was attracted to Didi, one of the Homa family daughters. At this time, there was much experimentation among African youth. On the rand with fashion, cults or gangs known by such names as Americans and Russians delighted in wearing pinstripe suits and Panama hats, and, if they could afford it, drive around in American cars. Mandela, very much drawn to the attractive Didi, felt rather humiliated when, simultaneously, a well-dressed dandy with whom he could not hope to compete in style and expensive clothes courted her. Didi barely took any 
notice of me, and what she did notice was the fact that I owned only one patched up suit, while her boyfriend wore expensive, double breasted American suits and wide brimmed hats. 6. Despite their poverty, Africans had their music. In the impoverished, black townships, music was a vital outlet of expression and could reflect both the frustrations of life and the hope of change. A popular musician of the time, General Dews, who later would play a Solidarity Benefit concert for the jailed Mandela, recalled that Mandela liked his jazz and would jive into the early hours. 7. Before long, Mandela was offered a job as an articled clerk with Sisulu's client, the law firm of Lazar Seidelsky, Witkin, Seidelsky, and Eidelman, whereas many whites continued to regard Africans purely as hewers of wood and drawers of water, Seidelsky, a Jewish lawyer with liberal ideas, and in favor of promoting African education, was ahead of his time in encouraging black professionals. He waived Mandela's fee and gave him a loan. Mandela each day took the train to the big city to work in this office, located in central Johannesburg. At night, he studied by candlelight to complete his Bachelor of Arts degree by correspondence. The law firm also employed two other young clerks, Nat Bregman and Gower Rad Ebe. Both were politically active in the Communist Party of South Africa, at the time the only multiracial political party in the City of Gold 27 country and which was attracting Africans to its ranks. Radebe also was prominent in the ANC and black labor unions, helping to found the African Mine Workers Union in 1941, as well as being active in Alexandra Bus Boycotts. Out of intellectual curiosity and African solidarity, Mandela attended some political meetings and social gatherings, where he met other young radicals, but he did not yet become active in organizations. However, he soaked up ideas on politics, which he viewed chiefly through the lens of racial oppression. When Mandela discovered that blacks and whites by convention had to use separate teacups even in Seidelsky's law office, he realized that racism permeated even many liberal white circles. Mandela learned about politics not just in Johannesburg. In the 1940s, Alexandra was the site of determined African resistance to white racism and exploitation. To Mandela, Alexandra was not only a treasured place in my heart, but also a township where Africans of different ethnic backgrounds came together with a sense of solidarity. In the cold winter of August 1943, Mandela marched with thousands of other protesters in the famous Alexandra bus boycott. Africans refused to accept an imposed price rise they could ill afford and instead walked the 10 miles to work. The long walk was no novelty for Mandela, as his lack of money often meant he had to do the same. After nine days of boycott, the bus company gave in and retracted the fare increases. Even before this, Mandela had begun to meet politically active Africans. Besides Sisulu and Radebe at the Homas Mandela had met a fellow tenant, Shriner Baduza, active in the Communist Party. However, it was to the ANC that Mandela would eventually give his loyalty, and Sisulu encouraged him to get involved with the organization. Okay. What helped Mandela make the connection between political theory and practice at this time was his first-hand experience of the harsh conditions of the lives of most urban Africans. In his first year on the Rand, Mandela remained quite poor. He earned only eight pounds a month and had to pay 1.5 pounds a month for bus fares and nearly the same again for rent as well as paying university fees. Once he bought basic foodstuffs and candles to study by, there was precious little left for things like clothes. Therefore, Mandela was most grateful to his landlord Mr. Homa for the regular hearty Sunday dinner he offered free of charge. Alexandra was terribly overcrowded and there were frequent police raids to arrest Africans who lacked or may have simply mislaid their passes. To Africans the pass laws were the supreme symbol of segregation and later of apartheid without a stamped passbook an African could be endorsed out of the cities that whites regarded as their own. 28 Nelson Mandela Preserve Police jailed thousands upon thousands of Africans of different income levels over minor pass law infringements, with some of them 
sent to work on prison farms. Police also frequently arrested or accosted African women for brewing traditional African beer, and this treatment of women was another cause of intense resentment. In 1942, after living for one year in Alexandra, Mandela moved in for a short time with a Thembu clansman at the Witwatersrand Native Labor Association compound, where he had free accommodation. Here, he met African royals visiting their clansmen working on the mines. One such royal acquaintance was the Queen Regent of Basutoland, who gently chided Mandela for his inability to speak other African languages besides Psychosa, his own language. Around this time, he also met and was reconciled with the regent, then visiting Johannesburg. Sadly, it was the last time Mandela was to see him alive, as John Jantaba died in mid-1942. Justice and Mandela hurried home to Mkekezwini but were just two late for the funeral. Even though he lingered a week at the great place, Mandela's outlook on life had changed, unlike Justice, who remained. To succeed his father as paramount chief, Mandela returned to Johannesburg determined to follow his own calling. In December of 1942, he finally earned the coveted Bachelor of Arts degree and the following month attended the graduation ceremony at Fort Hare. Members of his family including his mother and sister attended, but although the reconciliation with the regent had helped restore his faith in his Thembu culture, and despite being encouraged by his kinsman Kaiser Matanzima to return to the Transke to practice law, Mandela was now independent of the Thembu royal family. Inspired by the commitment and politics of activists such as Sisulu and Radebe to a broad, inclusive African nationalism, Mandela felt all the currents in my life were taking me away from the Transke and towards what seemed like the center, a place where regional and ethnic loyalties gave way before a common purpose. Thinking at his graduation about how much things had changed since he had first gone to Fort Hare, Mandela mused that having a successful career and comfortable salary were no longer my ultimate goals. I found myself being drawn into the world of politics because I was not content with my old beliefs. 9. The year 1942 witnessed an even more significant event. Mandela, at the urging of Sisulu and Radebe, made contact with the ANC, the oldest African political organization in the country. Africans from all around the country had founded the ANC in 1912 in response to the 1910 Union of South Africa, which had instituted a whites-only government. For three decades, the ANC, or Congress as it was widely known, had patiently. City of Gold 29 pursued a policy of peaceful and polite petitions that the all-white government invariably had ignored. At times Congress had campaigned vigorously against discriminatory legislation such as the 1913 Natives Land Act and Passes, but the 1930s had seen its own fortunes decline. However, under the leadership of the Johannesburg-based A. B. Schumer, ANC President 1940-1949, the movement not only revived but also modernized. Schuma, espousing African nationalist and liberal philosophies, had studied and worked in the United States for 13 years before returning to South Africa to work as one of the very few black physicians. He oversaw the ANC's steady growth to a more centralized, financially viable body. Membership grew from a mere 1,000 in the 1930s to 5,500 by 1947. Schuma's reforms included equality of membership for women, confirmed in a new 1943 ANC Constitution and the 1948 refounding of the ANC Women's League, improvements encouraged by Schuma's African-American second wife, Matty Hall, inspired by the Atlantic Charter of the Allies in World War II, Schuma established a committee that co-authored Africans' claims. In South Africa, 1943, a document calling for African self-determination. He also forged an alliance with the South African Indian Congress and strengthened ties with African labor unions. These changes in African politics resonated across the country as World War II intensified the entire political scene in South Africa. Some extreme Afrikaner nationalists traditionally opposed to Britain and, influenced by ideas of racial supremacy, supported the rise of Nazism and fascism in Europe and their brown shirt, gray shirt, and black shirt gangs. 
directed hate campaigns against both Africans and Jews in 1940s Johannesburg, combined with a thousand small jibes and insults of a racist. Society, Mandela began to move inexorably toward politicization. I had no epiphany, no singular revelation, no moment of truth, but a steady accumulation of a thousand slights, a thousand indignities, produced in me an anger, a rebelliousness, a desire to fight the system that imprisoned my people. 11. The 1940s were a time of revival for African politics in Johannesburg. In particular, this political revival reflected socio-economic conditions, changes, and the influence of new ideas. Despite the emergence of a pulsating African urban culture in this decade, facilities for the black middle, class were scanty, the few football, soccer fields that existed for blacks were bare and sandy, there were few African cinemas, and segregation and condescension were everywhere. Working and living conditions for the majority of Africans were bad. At the same time, the war years and particularly U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's intervention in the Atlantic charter raised the possibility of eventual African decolonization, and this 30 Nelson Mandela aroused broad feelings of African nationalism especially among idealistic young people such as Mandela. Interest in politics signaled Mandela's decisive move away from a narrow, COSA outlook toward an inclusive African nationalism that has always been the hallmark of Congress. At first, however, Mandela played a low-key role in African politics. He was still very busy with his education. In early 1943, after completing his law articles, he enrolled in a part-time law degree program at the University of the Witwatersrand, commonly known as WITS, a leading university of the country. Despite an undercurrent of racism among some whites at the university, one of Mandela's law professors openly declared that women and blacks were, biologically, ill-suited to becoming lawyers, and blacks were excluded from university, sports facilities and residences. WITS was, by South African standards of the time, a liberal university. Unlike Afrikaner universities, WITS at least allowed a small number of black students to enroll. Still, Mandela was the only African student in the entire law faculty. Far from shielding Mandela from politics, the WITS experience opened new contacts. For the first time, he now met and befriended progressive, politicized whites of his own age such as Joe Slovo and radical Indian. South African law students such as Jaya N. Singh and Ismail Mir. Singh, Mir, and Slovo were all members of the Communist Party. The Friends spent many nights discussing politics and socializing at Mir's inner city apartment, which Mandela found a convenient retreat to avoid evening curfews imposed on Africans. But in many ways he was the odd man out. Although impressed by some of the tenets of Marxism such as the classless society, Mandela hotly opposed communism in favor of African nationalism. Nevertheless, he began to appreciate that his new white and Indian friends were fully prepared to support the gathering national liberation struggle of Africans. In Mandela's words, they were prepared to sacrifice themselves for the cause of the oppressed. On one occasion, Mir, Singh, and Mandela, alighting without realizing it on a segregated tram, objected to the subsequent unconcealed racism of the conductor and found themselves arrested. The next day, the court exonerated the young men when their lawyer, another progressively minded friend and part-time lecturer Bram Fisher, whose father was the judge president of the Orange Free State, impressed the magistrate. 12. Besides his studies, another factor initially inclining Mandela away from involvement in full-time politics was his growing family commitment. In 1944, he met Evelyn Mays, a cousin of Walter Sisulu and like. Sisulu, also from Nkobo in Thembuland. The couple had met in the crowded home of Sisulu and his wife Albertina, where at times Mandela, City of Gold 31, stayed. Almost at once Mandela fell in love with Evelyn. It was the same. With her, I loved him the first time I saw him, there was something very special about Nelson. The couple married a month later in a quiet civil ceremony in Johannesburg. 
They lacked enough money for a traditional wedding and feast and were similarly obliged by lack of finance. And the dearth of black housing to live first with Evelyn's brother in Orlando East and then with her sister and husband in a small house at City Deep Mines. Later, in 1947, they moved into a tiny three-roomed matchbox house not far from the Sisulus in the barren landscape collectively known as Soweto, where the government had decided to dump Africans. 13. Their first son, Madiba Thembakile, Thembai, was born in 1946. Mandela delighted in playing with Thembai, bathing him and feeding him, and putting him to bed with a little story. He enjoyed domesticity, and Evelyn later reminisced that he also enjoyed doing the family shopping, even on occasions taking over the cooking from us women. He was, she notes, a well-organized person who rose at dawn, went jogging, and had a light breakfast, but politics increasingly kept him very busy. I was rarely at home to enjoy these things, he later wrote. Evelyn had company. When first Mandela's sister, Libby, joined them from the countryside to attend school, and then later his mother visited. There often were other visitors from the trans K. A daughter, Makazaway, was born in 1948 but was very frail. She died after only nine months, to the great distress of her parents. These changes in African politics resonated across the country as World War II intensified the entire political scene in South Africa. Some extreme Afrikaner nationalists, traditionally opposed to Britain and influenced by ideas of racial supremacy, supported the rise of Nazism and fascism in Europe and their brown shirt, gray shirt, and black shirt gangs, directed hate campaigns against both Africans and Jews in 1940s Johannesburg, combined with a thousand small jibes and insults of a racist society, Mandela began to move inexorably toward politicization. I had no epiphany, no singular revelation, no moment of truth, but a steady accumulation of a thousand slights a thousand indignities produced in me an anger, a rebelliousness, a desire to fight the system that imprisoned my people. 11. The 1940s were a time of revival for African politics in Johannesburg. In particular, this political revival reflected socio-economic conditions, changes, and the influence of new ideas. Despite the emergence of a pulsating African urban culture in this decade, facilities for the black middle class were scanty, the few football, soccer fields that existed for blacks were bare and sandy, there were few African cinemas, and segregation and condescension were everywhere. Working and living conditions for the majority of Africans were bad. At the same time, the war years and particularly U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's intervention in the Atlantic charter raised the possibility of eventual African decolonization, and this 30 Nelson Mandela aroused broad feelings of African nationalism, especially among idealistic young people such as Mandela. Interest in politics signaled Mandela's decisive move away from a narrow, COSA outlook toward an inclusive African nationalism that has always been the hallmark of Congress. At first, however, Mandela played a low-key role in African politics. He was still very busy with his education. In early 1943, after completing his law articles, he enrolled in a part-time law degree program at the University of the Witwatersrand, commonly known as WITS, a leading university of the country. Despite an undercurrent of racism among some whites at the university, one of Mandela's law professors openly declared that women and blacks were, biologically, ill-suited to becoming lawyers, and blacks were excluded from university sports facilities and residences, Wits was, by South African standards of the time, a liberal university. Unlike Afrikaner universities, Wits at least allowed a small number of black students to enroll. Still, Mandela was the only African student in the entire law faculty. Far from shielding Mandela from politics, the Wits experience opened new contacts. For the first time, he now met and befriended progressive politicized whites of his own age such as Joe Slovo and radical Indian. South African law students such as Jaya N. Singh and Ismail Mir. Singh, Mir, and Slovo were all members of the Communist Party, 
the friends, spent many nights discussing politics and socializing at Mir's inner city, apartment, which Mandela found a convenient retreat to avoid evening. Curfews imposed on Africans, but in many ways he was the odd man out. Although impressed by some of the tenets of Marxism such as the classless society, Mandela hotly opposed communism in favor of African nationalism. Nevertheless, he began to appreciate that his new white and Indian friends were fully prepared to support the gathering national liberation struggle of Africans. In Mandela's words, they were prepared to sacrifice themselves for the cause of the oppressed. On one occasion, Mir, Singh, and Mandela, alighting without realizing it on a segregated tram, objected to the subsequent unconcealed racism of the conductor and found themselves arrested. The next day, the court exonerated the young men when their lawyer, another progressively minded friend and part-time lecturer Bram Fisher, whose father was the judge president of the Orange Free State, impressed the magistrate. 12. Besides his studies, another factor initially inclining Mandela away from involvement in full-time politics was his growing family commitment. In 1944, he met Evelyn Mays, a cousin of Walter Sisulu and like Sisulu, also from Nkobo in Thembuland. The couple had met in the crowded home of Sisulu and his wife Albertina, where at times Mandela, city of gold 31, stayed. Almost at once Mandela fell in love with Evelyn. It was the same. With her, I loved him the first time I saw him, there was something very special about Nelson. The couple married a month later in a quiet civil ceremony in Johannesburg. They lacked enough money for a traditional wedding and feast and were similarly obliged by lack of finance and the dearth of black housing to live first with Evelyn's brother in Orlando East and then with her sister and husband in a small house at City Deep Mines. Later, in 1947, they moved into a tiny three-roomed matchbox house not far from the Sisulus in the barren landscape collectively known as Soweto, where the government had decided to dump Africans. 13. Their first son, Madiba Thembakile, Thembai, was born in 1946. Mandela delighted in playing with Thembai, bathing him and feeding him, and putting him to bed with a little story. He enjoyed domesticity, and Evelyn later reminisced that he also enjoyed doing the family shopping, even on occasions taking over the cooking from us women. He was, she notes, a well-organized person who rose at dawn, went jogging, and had a light breakfast, but politics increasingly kept him very busy. I was rarely at home to enjoy these things, he later wrote. Evelyn had company. When first Mandela's sister, Libby, joined them from the countryside to attend school, and then later his mother visited. There often were other visitors from the Transke. A daughter, Makazaway, was born in 1948 but was very frail. She died after only nine months, to the great distress of her parents. Evelyn Mays, born in 1922, was very different in personality than Mandela. Devoutly religious and rather apolitical, she did not share his enthusiasm for politics, although for a period she was encouraged by Oliver. Tambo's wife, Adelaide, to become active in the nurses' labor union. In contrast to the noble-born Mandela, her father was a humble mine worker, and both her parents died when she was a child. When they first met, she was training to be a nurse. Evelyn supported Mandela, still studying, by working for a year in what she later described as a terrible job with a mining company that paid the tiny amount of only seven and a half pounds a month. 15. By 1944, Mandela had established himself in Johannesburg. He had got used to the fast pace of urban living, completed his Bachelor of Arts, embarked on professional legal studies, and started a family. Yet despite the obligations of marriage and the rigor of legal studies, the political ideas and experiences that Mandela had piece by piece imbued over the last few years now began to crystallize around the need he perceived to actually do something about the awful predicament of his people. 32. Nelson Mandela Nelson Mandela was about to launch himself into the maelstrom of African politics that, over the next decade, would see him rise rapidly to become a prominent African political leader and a household name. 
across the country. He was to do this initially through an energetic new youth organization allied to the ANC that he would help develop with. The support of friends such as Sisulu and Oliver Tambo, his old student, friend from Fort Hare.